What's up, Ridge Church? Welcome, you guys. I'm so excited we get to hang out together for part three of Rescued. If it's your first day here during this series, your first Sunday in the series of Rescued, you'll be just fine. Um, if you have been here for the Rescued series already, you must be loving it to show up on this freezing cold day. Um, I, I was born and raised here in Charlotte. I don't remember a day that was this cold. I looked at it this morning. It was like 15, I think, at one point. It said 16 is the low, but I saw it at 15. Um, I just caught a glimpse of Jim back there, one of our pastors here at Ridge. He always stands up here and talks about how he moved from Maine down here to Charlotte. I think he often says to get away from the cold weather. Is that, is that not what you say? Um, I, so I was like, I was just curious. Um, it's warmer in Maine than it is it was here in Charlotte this morning. And I got really curious. I'm like, that was like coldest places on earth. Alaska, that's way warmer in Alaska this morning than Charlotte, North Carolina. Iceland, land made of ice, is warmer than Charlotte, North Carolina this morning. Um, we're, I looked up warmer. Oh, my wife's from Buffalo. I always like, you know, her family moved down here because it was so cold. Um, yeah, I know some people here like moved from Buffalo from like that New York area. Warmer in Buffalo in that northern western New York area than here in Charlotte today. Um, and there was one other place I looked up. I could, oh, Antarctica. Can you believe it? It was warmer in Antarctica this morning than in Charlotte, North Carolina. So you must be loving this series, Rescued, I guess. Um, it's thankfully nice and warm in here now, like once you get inside. Um, as well as, you know, I know uh, you must really want to be here because I think the experts say New Year's resolutions, they've kind of worn off by now. You kind of dropped them. It's like that first, I don't know what the window is, but it was somewhere around like Blue Monday. I think it was like last Monday. They're pretty much, you, you've, you've lost out on them. So if you're here at church, you really wanted to be here at church. You're really digging this Rescued series. I'm glad you guys are here today. Um, it, it may be, though, that church is kind of a newer thing for you. Like maybe you, maybe you did grow up in church, but you've kind of been away a long time and you're back, or maybe you're finding yourself to this church kind of for the first time um, or just to church in general for the first time in a long time. Really glad you're here. But I know for sure there's some of you in the crowd who grew up like me, and I basically grew up at church. I was at church all the time. In fact, I should calculate it sometime. I bet I spent about half my life at my church. We were there all the time. My parents made sure of it. Um, I kind of want a show of hands on this one if you're brave enough to raise your hand. If this ever happened to you, some of you who maybe like grew up at church, it was just a normal thing. Anybody else like me at least once you remember, you got left at church by your parents? Yeah, oh, wow. It was like... Okay, like several. Okay, thank you for being brave and honest. Okay, so it happened to me a couple times. Now, it wasn't super strange. I, I'm, I'm remembering like one time in particular with my parents, they both kind of were leaders or like served the church. They didn't like work at the church, but they were, you know, involved like leaders in their church. And I was a little kid, and so they just went early. But at different times, they served in different ministries. So it wasn't uncommon for us to drive two separate cars. Like my dad would go in, my mom would go in separately, um, as well as... Uh, <laughs> My dad was a very punctual person. He valued kind of being early. Um, my mom, I'm sure, valued that as well. She just didn't, uh, oftentimes, uh, most of the life that I knew her. Um, and so sometimes I could just choose, like, if I want to go early with my dad, maybe there's some donuts I could sneak they have for the volunteers. Or if I'm not really feeling church today, I could just roll into my mom because we'll maybe be not too early. Um, so when it came time to leave, it was usually like, oh, you know, Dad's probably got him. Mom's probably got him. And I can remember one time in particular, I was probably seven, eight years old, first, second grade, something like that. I was like the last one at the church. I didn't mind, mind you. I know this is like a dreaded thing, you know, for like a, a child to be lost. I felt pretty comfortable. I had kind of grown up at this church, and I felt like I had free roam of it until it was just the last person left, the this nicest man you'll ever meet, the janitor, the like custodian at our church. He's like cutting off the lights, locking the doors. Patrick, what are you doing here? He's nice enough. He calls my parents. You know, they come back and pick me up. It's like, oh, I thought, you know, can't believe. I don't know. I mean, it was a while. <laughs> they just didn't notice I was the only child even. So it could have been planned. I don't know. But I'm glad that some of us in the room, at least like a half dozen of us, share that bond. You were also left at church. Maybe we can swap stories sometimes. We joke about it. We laugh. It's funny to look back on. Ha ha, my parents left me. It's actually a horrible thing, right? It got me thinking about um, this movie, Home Alone. Uh, it was about four or five years ago, I think 2019. My wife and I decided, hey, it's time. Our kids are old enough. Let's start showing them, all, let's start watching with them all the movies that we grew up on when we were kids, like the movies that kind of raised us, late 80s, 90s. For the most part, they have loved it. It's been a little bit hit or miss, but I would say the majority of these movies the kids have loved. Home Alone's probably one of their favorites from kind of that era of our childhood, definitely at Christmas time. I think we watched it Christmas time of 2019 for the first time, or maybe it wasn't even Christmas. It was just summertime. I don't know. 
my kids have not ceased to set booby traps. Like, beware. If you come to our house, my boys used to have a sign on their door, beware, there are traps. But you would not be able to read it because it was spelled very interestingly, as it sounded kind of. Um, so they're just, they're all about that. And they, we've seen this movie ad nauseum to where you kind of don't pay attention to it anymore. And this past Christmas, we're with my wife's kind of whole family. We've gathered in Tennessee at one of her brother's homes. <clears throat> and it was maybe a day or two after Christmas. I think I was actually packing up, loading the car to come back home. And the movie's playing. The kids are all gathered around. The grandparents are there. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I know all these scenes. And I was kind of just struck in this moment thinking, wow, what a horrible thing to make a comedy movie around. This child is lost. The parents are separated. Did they fly to France? I can't remember. They, they're, yeah, is that, like they're out of the country. And it's not like they, you know, oh, somebody went and picked him up. They can't get a hold of him for like days. They're, you know, their mom's kind of properly freaking out. But it's, we're just laughing. So I was thinking, man, the creators of this movie, they did an incredible job to distract us from this horrible thing. One of the most horrible things in life that could happen and just get us to laugh all the way through it. But I'm, I'm carrying like a suitcase out to the van, and I just kind of stop and notice the final scene in the movie. It's like touching. The mom comes back. She gets Kevin, gives him a hug. It's all, you know, they're reunited. But then the whole rest of the family comes in, and it's all loud and boisterous. And I just paid attention to the dad. If you Forgive me if you haven't seen Home Alone. I'm making a bit of assumption here that everybody's seen it, but um, you have to go home and watch it if you haven't seen it. The dad comes in, and it's as if Kevin's been away at camp. Or like with the grandparents, oh, Kevin, my boy. I think that's literally what he says. Gives him a hug. He's like, how you been? Or, and I'm like, what? How disturbing. Like, this is not how, like, he hasn't had a phone conversation with the mom. They didn't text, I think, back then. Like, he had no idea. Like, this is the first time he's realizing his son is alive in however long. And that's your, re like, that is not how parents of lost children react. So I actually went searching for some real, real clips, like, that we could watch. This is a really powerful thing I want to show you guys that I found of, a dad, how a dad reacted when his young son was lost. You guys check this out. I think it's a CBS, uh, CBS News clip. We end tonight with a story about parents' love and an epic search for a lost son. Here's CBS's Remy Innocencio. <laughs> a remarkable reunion after decades of heartache. This week in China, two parents were reunited with their son, kidnapped 24 years ago. He was just two years old, stolen, playing outside his home. His father, Guo Gangtang, never stopped searching for his kidnapped son, crisscrossing China on a motorbike, chasing down clues and handing out flyers. Over the years, he traveled more than 300,000 miles, a banner with a boy's face waving in the wind behind him. That's what parents do, right? Of lost children. You've got a lost child, that's what parents do. That's an actual, real-life reaction. And even if I get it, there's probably a lot of people in the room today who, who aren't parents. But you can still feel that, right? Because it's such a big deal. If someone's child were lost, someone that you knew, if your friend called you, aren't there a lot of things that you would drop? Things that you thought were important? You'd say, oh, that's, that's actually not important anymore because my friend's child is lost. I'm going to go help in some way. Even if it weren't a friend, even if we don't know the person. Does anybody else deeply disturbed when you get the, the alerts on your phone, like the Amber alert, like text things that blow your phone up, or they come across the TV, or you're driving on the highway and they're on those signs. I'm, it's like messes me up for a little while when I see that because I'm just thinking about that child. I'm thinking about that parent, what they must be going through. Like I guess if it were me, I would just be knocking on doors. Like I would just want to be doing something, asking anyone, like have you seen my child? I, <laughs> I'll confess, a few times I've prayed like, I want to see the vehicle, you know? Like, I'll, I'll try to memorize the license plate number in my head when they show it, because I'm like, oh, I bet that was, that's what the mom is doing. She's probably got it memorized, looking around. And I pray, like, I'd love to see it one. Like, I'd, I'd love to be the one to get to call the police. Like, hey, I've got them. Like, here they are, and I'm going to tail them until you guys get here, because, like, this child needs to get back home safely to their mom, to their dad. It's kept me up at night before, because I've, I've laid there in bed thinking, like, this, this mom or dad, they're not sleeping tonight because their child is lost, and it's almost as if nothing else matters in those moments. But definitely, if it were a friend of yours, you would you would probably go search in the woods with them, put up posters. You'd do probably whatever they asked you to do. I imagine I would think if someone who's a part of this church, God forbid, your child went missing, you lost your child, I would imagine word would kind of travel around, and, and this somehow this local body, we would kind of come together. We would want to join in and help this person who... who worships at the same church as us, find their lost child. 
But then think about it. When that child is found, wouldn't you want to be there to celebrate with the parents? Wouldn't you just want to drop everything to party with them? You just want to be there for that. We saw a little glimpse of it um, with, with that dad, like reunited with the son. Maybe there's nothing better than that, actually, a lost son or daughter finally coming home. I want to show you just two other short clips of dads finding their sons. One is just the reunion moment. That's all it is. This first one is actually also in China. I, mean, I think it'll, it'll tell you about it in the, the subtitles, a, a four-year-old son. Um, it was lost for 14 years, and it's just the dad. I think the mom is there as well um, when they find him. The second one is actually, Chris mentioned, I uh, preached this uh, similar sermon about nine or 10 years ago, and it's a, it was a fresh clip I had found then, and I went back and watched it again. I was like, I just, I want to show that again. Back then, it, was, it had just happened. The war in Syria was, was raging. Um, there was this uh, young son who everyone thought had died in a chemical attack um, because of this war in Syria. And you're going to get to see the moment when they first bring the son back to the dad. And he realizes my son is still alive and, and see that. You guys sit back and, and let these do what they do to you. There's no other emotion quite like that, right? And unless someone here in the room speaks Arabic or Mandarin, I imagine, we have no idea too many of the words that are being spoken, but I don't think we need to, right, to capture what's happening. And it's, it's difficult to even imagine. We, we don't often see people acting with that kind of emotion. And at the same time, there at the end of that last clip, even though it's such a kind of a sacred, holy moment, wouldn't you really want to be there just to be a fly on the wall just watching? Like, you could see how many people were crowding in. They all wanted to be there. They're got to be kissing on someone, hugging someone. It was this emotional yet celebratory moment like, hey, to this father, you've, <laughs> you've got him back. You've got your son back. And it, and it seems like in those moments, it's as if nothing else matters. Wouldn't you want to do the same? If it were someone you knew, maybe someone you didn't even know, but you just heard there was this, there was this gathering. Someone has their lost son, their lost daughter back. Maybe it's a friend. They call you at work like, hey, I've got my, my, your neighbor. I don't know. Like my, my lost son has come home. Will you come help me hang this welcome home banner? You would say, yes, I'll leave work early right now. It wouldn't matter if you felt like you were good at hanging banners. It wouldn't matter how much you thought hanging banners mattered. Like that's, none of that is the point. You just really want to be a part of that. Like you'll grab some ice on the way home. No kind of peace in the story is too small. You just want to be a part of stories like that and moments like that. I brought this book. I just want to read. It's actually just uh, 
a half of one page and a half of another page I want to read to you guys. I read this book, um, I think either when I was in college or just after college, my early 20s. It's by a guy named Philip Yancey, What's So Amazing About Grace. Maybe some of you have read it. Um, <clears throat> I was just moved by this story that he tells in the book, and I, I wanted to read part of it to you guys. In fact, let me, I'll cut most of it out and just give you some of the context. It's a story of a teenage girl who, as often teenagers can feel, um, they want a bit more freedom than their parents will give, and so she runs away from home. She grew up in uh, Traverse City, Michigan. She runs away to Detroit pretty early on, finds herself in a not-so-great area of Detroit, um, which some of you, if you're from Detroit or you've been to Detroit, maybe you're wondering, are there any other parts of Detroit than the not-so-great areas? But that's the kind of area she finds herself in. Um, she has an addiction, very expensive habit, um, and finds herself selling her body in order to make the money um, to pay for these addictions that she has. And I'm going to pick up the story where it seems like she comes to her senses. <clears throat> she says, God, why did I leave? She says to herself, and pain stabs at her heart. My dog back home eats better than I do now. She's sobbing, and she knows in a flash that more than anything else in the world, she wants to go home. Three straight phone calls, three straight connections with the answering machine. She hangs up without leaving a message the first two times, but the third time she says, Dad, Mom, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way, and it'll get there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus until it hits Canada. It takes about seven hours for a bus to make all the stops between Detroit and Traverse City. And during that time, she realizes the flaws in her plan. What if her parents are out of town and missed the message? Shouldn't she have waited another day or so until she could talk to them? Even if they are home, they probably wrote her off as dead long ago. She should have given them some time to overcome the shock. So her thoughts bounce back and forth between those worries and the speech she's preparing for her father. Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's all mine. Dad, can you forgive me? She says the words over and over, her throat tightening even as she rehearses them. She hasn't apologized to anybody in years. The bus has been driving with lights on since Bay City. Tiny snowflakes hit the pavement, rubbed, by, rubbed worn by thousands of tires, and the asphalt steams. She's forgotten how dark it gets at night out here. A deer darts across the road, and the bus swerves. Every so often, a billboard. A sign posting the mileage to Traverse City. <clears throat> Oh, God, she thinks. When the bus finally rolls into the station, its air brakes hissing in protest, the driver announces in a crackly voice over the microphone, 15 minutes, folks. That's all we have here. 15 minutes to decide her future. She checks herself in a compact mirror, smooths her hair, and licks the lipstick off her teeth. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingertips and wonders if her parents will notice if they're there. <clears throat> she walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect, but not one of the thousand scenes that have played out in her mind prepare her for what she sees there in the concrete walls and plastic chairs bus terminal of Traverse City, Michigan, stands a group of 40 brothers and sisters, great aunts and uncles and cousins and a grandmother and great grandmother to boot. They're all wearing goofy party hats and blowing noisemakers and taped across the entire wall of the terminal is a computer generated banner that reads, welcome home. Out of the crowd of well-wishers breaks her dad. She stares out through the tears quivering in her eyes like hot mercury and begins the memorized speech. Dad, I'm sorry, I know, but he interrupts her. Hush, child. We've got no time for that. No time for apologies. You'll be late for the party. A banquet is waiting for you at home. Now, lest any of you think I'm a cyborg, I sat in my office in my basement earlier this week preparing for this talk, reading that story over and over, watching those clips over and over, just weeping, <laughs> and like, wow, I'm gonna have to cut this. Um, so. The reason there's no tears right now is because uh, of reps, I think. Because I think we're moved by things like that. I, I think probably all of us in the room are moved to the point that wouldn't we just want to be there to witness a moment 
like that. And, and maybe, especially some of you who, who grew up in church like me, as those emotions are hitting you, as I read that story, maybe there's another story that was already coming to your mind, maybe a story that Jesus told is quite famous. Maybe even if you didn't grow up in church, it's quite possible that you're familiar with kind of the gist of this story. Many people have called the story of the prodigal son or the story of the lost son. And if you're familiar with the gist, it just goes something like this, that there's this younger son who decides he knows best, he knows better than his father, as young sons often do, asks for his inheritance, his trust fund, all that stuff up front, all in advance just so he can go. He wants to move to Amsterdam, Vegas, someplace like that, and just party it up. And so he does, and he goes, lives wildly, makes some choices on his own. And we don't really know how long this lasts, but he just we know Jesus says in the story he lives kind of wastefully and selfishly. It doesn't take too long to deplete the whole thing, all these riches that are supposed to last him for the rest of his life, that whole trust fund, the college fund, the inheritance. He realizes he's got no money in the middle of this struggling economy. Strange city, he doesn't know. He's looking for a job, he's looking in whatever version of the want ads, probably standing on the corner outside Home Depot just hoping to pick up some kind of day laboring job and there's basically nothing except feeding the pigs, but there's fine print in the contract he signs that says, oh, by the way, you can't eat the pig's food. That's how bad it is. And it gets so bad for him, he's so hungry that he's standing there staring at the pig's food like, wow, I'm so hungry, I could just gobble that up. And maybe it's in one of these moments Jesus is trying to portray in this story that it kind of hits him. There's this moment where he comes to his senses and he thinks, I'm an idiot. (laughs) I should have never left home. In fact, I should go back home. But of course, he assumes he won't be welcomed back by his father as a son at least, so he'll take a shot maybe as a servant. He prepares the speech. You probably know the ending as well, though. The dad sees him coming from way far away. The dad takes off sprinting almost indignantly, throws a big bear hug arms around his son, starts kissing him all over, doesn't let his son get his speech out. He just starts yelling to his employees on like the farm or whatever they were on saying, hey, everybody, stop what you're doing. My son, he's home. He smells really bad. He smells like a pig. What in the world have you been doing? Hey, he needs a spa treatment. Run to the mall. Get him some new clothes. You guys know his sizes. Get him that, like, fancy ring we've been saving. You guys know the big, fat baby cow we've been saving. If the king ever comes over, go kill that bad boy. We're having a party tonight. We're about to have a feast. This is how Jesus uh, puts the words in the loving father's mouth in Luke 15, 23 and 24. This father says, let's have a feast And celebrate because my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and has been found. I love the way Jesus kind of tells this part of the story. Jesus just says, so they had a big party. They had this big party, this huge party. I love the image. I don't know what kind of image you have in your mind. I'm thinking like DJ, dance floor, you know, one of those like pigs on like the slow rotating fire thing with the apple in its mouth. Probably not first century Jewish uh, culture. (laughs) The baby cow, though, we know, like he said, go, like, kill the baby cow. Later in the story, uh, the loving father says this uh, in verse 32. To the older brother, which the older brother is another sermon for another day, but this is what he says to the older brother. The father says, but we had to celebrate and be glad. We, We had to because, duh, that's what you do when lost sons come home. We had to celebrate because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found so we had to party. And don't we all, every single one of us in this room, want to be a part of something like this? Let me just back up one verse before Jesus starts telling this story. Like the, the last words Jesus says before he says, there was a man who had two sons, and he, and he tells this famous story of the prodigal or the lost son. Luke chapter 15, verse 10, Jesus to his audience says, can't you understand? There is joy in the presence of all God's messengers, all God's angels. Some translations say in the presence of heaven. There's, there's this rejoicing, partying in the presence of heaven over even one sinner, one person who changes their way of life. That thing that's translated for us in English as changing the way of life. Uh, other versions might use this word you're maybe familiar with if, if you've been around church a long time. It's repent. It's just this Greek word, metanoia kind of two words crammed together that just means to change your mind. Literally, I was living this way, I was walking this way, I was kind of following something, and I decided in my mind 
I was going to turn around and walk a different way. Maybe literally for the first time for people I wasn't following Jesus and I made this decision, made this choice in my mind to follow Jesus. I was living in a way of not following Jesus and now I'm deciding to. And Jesus says in those moments, heaven throws a party. Because it's as if, he goes on to tell the story, it's as if in those moments, a lost son is reunited with his loving father's lost sons and daughters coming home. That's, that's what's happening in these moments. So Jesus is trying to give us a window into, I think, God's mind, God's heart in this very beautiful way through this very emotional story that I, that I imagine would have conjured the same emotions that many of us are feeling this morning, seeing those clips, hearing that story read for his first century audience. Jesus is equating somebody who changes their way of life with all the joy, all the emotion of a lost son or daughter returning home. Even angels get it on the act. Like they can't help but party because I told you, we all just want to be there, to be a part of it, to be a part of moments like this. If I could, just for a moment, when we say lost, by the way, I, I hope that doesn't sound derogatory in any kind of way. It's not meant to be because this prodigal, this son, he wasn't actually lost, right? The son knew right where he was. He, he meant to go to that Vegas-like city, wherever it was. I think it's more lost from the parent's perspective, right? And we've all felt that. It's, it's probably not lost geographically, but lost in some way. If you are currently or you have already raised teenagers, I imagine <laughs> there are times when they're right up there in their bedroom, and it's like, oh, no, but, like, they're lost. You feel that as a parent. So I think this is from God's perspective and, and shining this light on how God must feel about all of us at times, because God has this dream for our lives. He, Jesus literally came so that we could have life to the full, and when we're walking in different directions, he wants nothing more than us to change our mind, change our life, and, and turn back toward him. When, it, when we run away, that's all he wants is for us to come back. It, really, this lost son in the story, I mean, it's all of us at different times and seasons in our lives, which is tricky to talk about at a place like this at Ridge Church because everybody looks so good. You guys do. I can, I can see most of you, even though these lights are here. You guys look really good. You guys are well-dressed. Everybody, you know, it's kind of like that Sunday best kind of thing. It's kind of ironic. Church feels like oftentimes the one place where you kind of got to get your act together. You, you kind of, if you're broken, you're feeling lost. It's like, oh, I, I, I maybe shouldn't go to church until I kind of, mm, I, I shouldn't go to church looking like I'm lost. So oftentimes, like, oh, man, everybody, everybody looks good. There's no lost folks here. There's no broken people here. There's no people, like, wandering away from a loving father here, because look at everybody. They got the nice smile, makeup's on, hair's did. They got their, like, favorite outfit on. It's a little bit ironic, because shouldn't church be, like, the one place in the world where if you're just broken, busted at the bottom, this is the one place we can show up? It's kind of like the gym. <laughs> Often people feel like, oh, the gym is where, like, if I'm out of shape, I need to exercise. I need to go to the gym. No, nah, actually, I need to do some stuff on my own just to kind of get up to the level to go to the gym. No. That's not what the gym is for. That's not what church is about. So I think, I don't know, if, if, if you're feeling like you're the only lost person here, if you're feeling like you're the only broken person at the bottom here, maybe I've got some good news for you. There's, there are a lot of us. In some way, we've, we've, we've turned from our loving Father, and we're walking in a direction that God wants nothing more than for us to turn around, change our mind, and come home, whether it's the way we treat our kids, our spouse, our coworkers decisions we make that maybe nobody else even knows about. And I think Jesus is saying, when we make those decisions, to turn our lives around, people even sitting here today, it's as big a deal as a lost son or daughter coming back home. So I think we forget that every single Sunday, there's people walking in these doors, sitting in these seats, sitting in small groups and students and children who God wants nothing more than to make this decision to come back home. I think we forget we sit with people at work every Monday morning who are lost, broken. God, this loving Father, wants nothing more than for them to change their mind, to make this decision, to come back home. Every Thursday afternoon, evening, I don't know, out in your cul-de-sac on your street, we forget. We're interacting with, waving with, talking with, across the fence, across the driveway, lost sons and daughters. So I think what we're doing here, both as a church and just as Jesus followers, wherever, wherever God has put us in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces, with the people you interact with, this is what we're doing here. Jesus tells us this story to say that this mission we're on matters just as much as finding your kidnapped daughter, your lost runaway son. And again, isn't that something we all want to be a part of, that reunion moment? 
So in light of this reality, in light of this connection, I think Jesus tries to make for us, what if we, as individuals and as a church, what if we treat every person who walks through these doors of our church, every person who walks through the doors of our lives, every person who, who interacts with us in any way, what if we treat them the way a loving father would treat his own lost son or daughter? May this be the mission of Ridge Church. May it be our mission as Jesus followers to be a physical representation of this loving father because we know what a loving father would do, right? And I say loving father over and over, by the way, because I, I want to apologize if for you, if you didn't have a loving earthly father. I know that's many, many, many people's story. That's not what we're talking about, obviously. We're talking about how a loving father would be. We all know how a loving father would be when someone is lost, um, this is what loving fathers do. Loving fathers are obsessed with who is lost, right? We talked about that before. Like we know it from the guy in China. They made a movie about him. I want to go see the movie. It's like he rode 300,000 miles. That's what, loving fathers are obsessed with who are lost. I don't know if that guy had any other kids. I bet he did, but they were found. They were okay. He was obsessed with who is lost. Loving father doesn't spend time probably sitting back in the lazy boy. Like, well, my daughter's missing. You know, that's probably the pastor's job. I mean, uh, that's the police's job, you know, to go find them. I think I'll just like, no way. The loving father is doing whatever he can figure out to do. Is obsessed until the child is home. Loving fathers, we know, keep the lights on for as long as it takes, right? If it were you, your mom, your dad, your son or daughter is gone, it wouldn't matter how many years, right? You wouldn't give up until... God forbid you saw their cold, lifeless body confirm that they were dead. You're not turning off the front porch light. You're leaving it on like if they ever choose to come home, if they're ever able to come home. We, we as parents, we would leave the lights on for as long as it takes. And if Jesus is saying this is actually what's at stake, <laughs> there's no people we should give up on either, right? Nobody is too far gone. We keep the lights on, the doors open, our arms spread wide. We keep a spot open in the small group hopefully a spot open around your dinner table. Keep the dance floor ready for the party. As long as there's hope, as long as they're still out there, there's still hope, so we leave the lights on. Because, you know, there's no way for us to know what people are going through. Odds are, I'm guessing, this many people in a room this size, there's some couple showing up today kind of on the brink of talking about about to get divorced. That's probably just the reality based on the odds. So there's somebody you're gonna be with tomorrow at your job, in your neighborhood, that is going through financial or physical or some kind of mental hell. Absolutely, they've hit rock bottom, and you might not know it. You might not see it. But they're a lost son or daughter. Life is going off the deep end for them, and you think that all you did when you showed up here this morning was stand in the freezing cold and kind of point their car in between two painted white lines so they could get out and get in here safely. But no. You are this physical representation of a loving father to a lost son or daughter that God just wants to welcome home. You thought all you did at work by the water cooler, all you did in the neighborhood was ask someone, how are you doing really? But no, actually in that moment, you cared enough. You were attempting to be this physical representation of a loving father who simply wants to welcome home lost sons and daughters. Last thing loving fathers do, we know, is loving fathers throw parties. So that's what we want this place to be about, this church. That's why, like, this church, I mean, one of the reasons this church began was to throw parties for, for welcome home reunions like this. This is what we want to be a part of. We've established that. When we engage in the mission of Jesus, it's with this party in mind. And when you think about it this way, I don't think there's any of us who don't want to be a part of the party. Like, wasn't your heart moved when I read this story from this book? Like, didn't you want to be at that bus station in Traverse City, Michigan, just like catching a bus anywhere else? Like, I would give anything just to witness something like that, even if I didn't know the whole backstory and all the emotion that was in that. This is a story we all want to be a part of. And guys, this is what God is up to in the world, right? The, the world is broken. It's messed up. God doesn't want to leave it that way. God is making everything right in the world. God's attempting to make everything new, which includes, a big part of it, is rescuing lost sons and daughters. And if this is what God's up to, this is what God's church has to be up to, it's what we, if we claim to follow Jesus, should be up to. So, I don't know, don't engage 
in the mission of this church. Don't engage in the mission of Jesus because we feel like we have to. Do it because I think there's something in all of us. I bet it's the way we were made. It's probably part of God's image in us that we just want to be a part of this because there aren't many things better. I also think, just to slip this in here, we need to be people, adults. We need to be a church of people who are doing this, who are being a physical representation of a loving father. We're welcoming home lost sons and daughters to this party that we're throwing. Because where else do you think our kids are going to learn this from? We talk a lot about we want to be for the next generation. Where do you think the next generation is going to learn to be a church that does this, that they don't, they're not able to see us, they're not able to watch us do this? And you've been a lost son or daughter at some point in your life, right? Maybe not too long ago, maybe at many points. And if it weren't for a loving father, if it weren't for the physical representation of a loving father in your life, you fill in the blank. I don't know, where would you be? And I don't know who that physical representation of a loving father was for you. Maybe a real dad, maybe a mentor, maybe a small group leader, maybe a boss, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor. So when we think of it this way, I mean, no role is too small to play at the welcome home party, right? Like there's no, I'll hang a banner. I'll do whatever. I would, I would love to do anything. Like I'll take the photos. I'll like stand back. I'll, I'll do, I'll like open the door hold the door open. I'll do anything at that party, like hand out Starbursts out of a little bucket to third graders. I don't know. There's no role that's too small for this because I don't know if anything's bigger than this. So I don't know what step some of you in the room need to take today. I'm confident, myself included, we all need to take some kind of step. Maybe, maybe you're somebody here, you've kind of been all out engaged in the mission of Jesus for a long time and you're maybe just kind of tired Maybe just kind of forgotten that it matters this much. Maybe just all, the only step you needed today was to kind of move this back front and center. Oh, yeah, this is what Jesus said. This, this matters a lot. I was just kind of showing up to church serving. I was just kind of trying to, you know, invite people to Jesus in my life, in my neighborhood. And I, and I kind of, I don't know, I was just doing it, going through the motions. Now I'm, I just need to be reminded. I just need to take this step to keep this in my mind, to be reminded this is how much it matters. Maybe you need to take a step of engaging in what your local church is up to. Or maybe beyond. Maybe some of you do. It's like, oh, yeah, I could do that on Sundays. I'll sign up to, like, serve or I'll, you know, invite people. I'll give. I'll, you know, be a part of a small group or do all these things at my church. But, you know, just for Sunday and, like, rarely do you engage in the mission of Jesus the rest of the week. So maybe the step for you is, like, Monday, tomorrow to wake up and let this be the filter, the lens for you for how you're going about living your life. Maybe, maybe your step is totally different and maybe you didn't hear much that I said today because maybe you're thinking the whole time in your mind, I'm the lost son or daughter in some way. There's a whole different kind of step. You know, I need to take Patrick. I'm the one who's, who's walking the wrong way. I need that change of mind. I need to change my life. I need, to, I need that metanoia, that repentance. Maybe for the first time ever, like, I need to put my faith in Jesus. I need to stop not following Jesus and decide to trust Jesus as Savior, to follow Jesus. If that's you today, that's amazing. We, some of us here at this church, we'd love to talk with you. You can grab any of us today if you want to talk to somebody face-to-face. If you're scared to talk to somebody face-to-face, I get that. I think there's QR codes still on the back of your chairs. You can scan it. There's lots of different button options you can push on your phone just to say, like, this, I want to talk with someone. I want somebody to pray with me. Please let us know about that step. If that's you, or maybe it's just something else. You, are, you follow Jesus, but, oh, man, you haven't really been at home. <laughs> You've run away, and you're ready to come back. Maybe, maybe that's your step. Or maybe you haven't heard a word I said, because the emotions rushed in on you because you are the loving father. You are the loving mother and you've got a kid who knows how old they are and they're the prodigal. They're the lost one. And I'm sorry. I can't imagine that pain. Not lost, obviously, physically, but somehow lost in the relationship or lost in their, they've they've turned away from God in some way and you don't want that for them. The only encouragement I think I have for you is just to fight for that relationship. That's the only thing that matters. Like, if that relationship can be good between you and them, don't ever let your faith get in the way of a relationship with your child. In fact, if your faith is somehow getting in the way, it's the thing stopping you having a relationship with your teenage, adult, son, daughter, then you somehow probably need to adjust your faith. It's not not going well in your faith. It can't be the thing that blocks the relationship between you and your son or daughter. 
Um, I want to invite Kelsey and the band uh, back. They're going to they're gonna lead us in a song, which I think is going to be um, just the perfect way to end our time together today. Um, in fact, you're going to hear uh, <laughs> a line in the song. I didn't hear the full song until this morning they were playing. It's, it's an amazing song. Um, I tried to listen to it on my phone just to kind of get the idea of the chorus, um, and it's perfect. But there's a line in the song that is literally one of the slides uh, that I read, and, and some of the folks say, oh, yeah, it seems like you... You probably built your slides knowing this would be the song, you know, like the closer. No, I wrote this sermon like nine or ten years ago and like didn't change the slides. It's like still the same thing. It's, it's very appropriate, I think, to, to close this out today. Maybe some of you are still wanting like a real, like Patrick, you've been, you've been general. I want a really practical something. Like I want to know how I can play a part really practically if I could for you guys. Um, inviting is a really practical way you can play a part just to invite people both to this church, if, if that feels simple for you, or just invite them to Jesus through conversations. Invite them like, hey, this is how it worked when I started to follow Jesus. I'll invite you, like extend the same invitation to you. Maybe it's investing. Maybe we don't talk about that enough in a church because it feels like weird to talk about, but I mean, I haven't been cold since I left my house. How about you guys? <laughs> Take some money to like create environments where it's warm on a 16 degree morning, and it takes people giving generously from their hearts to invest. And that, in fact, um, speaking of welcome home parties, it was like two weeks ago, um, we threw this epic party on a Sunday night. Some of you were probably here called The New Me, and we just celebrated people, mainly younger folks, my daughter, my 12-year-old daughter included, who recently took this public step to follow Jesus, were baptized, and we just threw this big party. I am not trying to throw shade on any other kind of church, any other kind of church that's trying to, to do the Jesus thing in the world. That is not my heart at all in this statement, quite the opposite. But I will say, I was thinking back to my baptism. <laughs> I grew up in church. It was like an afterthought for like 30 seconds after the service. They threw a white robe on me. This old man said some stuff. I had no idea what he was saying. I'm sure it was meaningful. Dunked me underwater. Everyone sat down. Like nobody was even standing up. Nobody said a word. There was no, I don't think even people clapped because like that wasn't really something we did. And it was done. That's not how you welcome lost sons and daughters home. Like, let's spend a little bit of money. Let's make it memorable. Let's throw a party. I'm sure that's what you want to be a part of as well. Um, investing, I think, is not only financially. We used to say all the time at this church, this strategic idea of, like, to invest in people and then invite them to Jesus or then invite them to church. Like, there's this relational investment we can make. Um, I just thought about, man, a, a practical step to take is just to be intentional. Be intentional with how you live your life. Be, intentionally serve here at this church. Intentionally be a part of what this church is trying to do to welcome lost sons and daughters home. Be intentional just how you live in your neighborhood, how you interact with people at your job, how you treat people. There's so many things that could go such a long way. And I wanted just to say for this fourth really practical thing to, to pray, because it's a really cool idea just to pray um, for people that you know are lost sons and daughters. Maybe write down their name because you care about them. Um, I don't know fully how prayer works, but I know we're called to do it. If, if, you've, if you want life to the full for someone, you want this eternal life for someone that you care about, you know God wants it for them too, write their name down and pray for them. And then I'm like, I say I never do this, but I had like these three eyes already. Invite, invest, um, being intentional. And I was like, okay, we should change prayer. If you're gonna pray on behalf of someone, let's make that intercede just so I don't know four eyes right there. Maybe it'd be easy to remember, just like simple steps that we can each take. There's a lot more ways each of us can play a part. Your personality, your, your, your giftings are going to determine that. Um, how we can play a part practically in joining God and what he's doing, welcoming home lost sons and daughters. But we got to find some way. Because deep down in your heart, you want to be a part of this. I think God made us that way. I think that's part of us being created in God's image. So just find, find your way. Find multiple ways. And then celebrate when it happens. That's what we're going to do together now. Um, the band is, is about to play this song. And, um, yeah, we just want to celebrate the fact that God does this, the fact that God welcomes prodigals home, and we have the chance to be a part of it. So have that celebration in your mind as we sing this song. I'm going to pray for us first. God, you're awesome. Thank you that you are this loving father that Jesus told the story about. Thank you that, wow. Thank you that you are the loving father to us so many times in our lives when in so many different ways we've just run away. We thought we knew better. And you always welcome us back, God. You're, you're standing with open arms right now, ready to welcome any of us back. 
God, may we be the same kind of people. Give us wisdom to know how to do it. Help us take really practical steps this week to engage in the mission that you're up to. Help us get excited to celebrate when we see this happening. Help us be motivated to join you in simply being a physical representation of the loving Father that you are. In Jesus' name, amen.